John Congleton is an American music producer with an enormous body of work. The list of artists he's collaborated with numbers well into the hundreds and includes many of the biggest names in the music industry. In 2015, he won a Grammy for his work on St. Vincent's self-titled album when it was declared the best alternative music album of 2014. Few people on earth understand how to make music sound good the way John Congleton does. But when he makes music himself, it sounds like this. Go ahead, good friend, scream all you want to. You're legless and limping and lost and it's just like they like you. And I can feel your tender bodies coming near. I see them hanging from the crystal chandelier. I'm hope for the hopeless, I'm help for the helplessly hopeful. In John's role as singer and guitarist of the band The Paper Chase, he writes and performs experimental alt-rock that intentionally makes listeners uncomfortable. His true talent isn't merely to make things pleasing to the ear, but rather to convey feelings through sound alone. And the feeling he wishes to instill with his own creations is anxiety. So what happens when someone with anxiety issues learns that there's scientific proof that the world as they know it is likely to end within their lifetime? I'm sure most people watching this have answered that question themselves by now, but John Congleton answered it back in 2009 with a concept album about natural disasters and global annihilation. The Paper Chase, often stylized such that only the A's are capitalized, were founded in the year 1998 in Dallas, Texas. The band was initially a collaboration between, from right to left, bassist Bobby Weaver, keyboardist Matt Armstrong, drummer Aaron Dalton, and the aforementioned John Congleton. If it seems like John dominates the narrative of this story, it's because he's the dominant creative force in the band. He's their producer, lyricist, and sole credited songwriter on all but a handful of songs, which he co-wrote. Further contributions he made to the signature Paper Chase style include his nervous vocals, guitar choices that are objectively wrong but work anyway through sheer force of will, and live shows that fall somewhere between performance art and a particularly over-the-top Jim Carrey role. And I don't His passion for music production was initially sparked when he was 15 and his high school band booked their first studio recording session. He would spend the rest of his teen years helping other local bands with the technical elements of their own recordings. After two years in college, he called it quits for his studies and spent a year in Chicago, where he apprenticed under Steve Albini from the band Big Black in his studio, Electrical Audio. By 1998, he was back in Texas and started to get his first professional jobs at the Dallas Sound Lab, engineering disparate things like gospel albums and hair metal bands to build up his resume for his eventual career aspirations. All that time spent working on music had filled his head with bizarre, creative ideas of his own that had no place in the garage bands and religious stainers he was working with at the time. The earliest Paper Chase recordings served as an outlet for all these strange ideas, recordings which first began to surface in January of 1999 when the split album to which they had contributed six songs was released. Later that same year, they put out a two-song EP titled And the Machines Are Winning, followed in the year 2000 by their first full album, Young Bodies Heal Quickly You Know. In general, the music of the Paper Chase is meant to explore the human condition that terrifying world behind the eyes of each and every person around you, and the dark corners of your own mind. In this way, they endeavor to demystify some of the harsher aspects of daily life and take away some of their power. If you think of their output as more of a surrealist Lynchian horror film than standard rock music, you might be in a better mindset to enjoy or at least appreciate what they have to offer. In addition to this overall theme, each of their albums has its own specific concept that it explores throughout, and their debut album is all about anxiety. 
that is to say, generalized anxiety disorder and its symptoms, like the sense of impending catastrophe it instills in a person, and the experience of panic attacks, which John suffered from as a teenager and into adulthood. About a year after Young Bodies Heal Quickly, the Paper Chase put out another notable release titled Control Alt Delete U. This is technically an album. It does have an overarching concept about humanity's struggle to integrate rapidly advancing technology into everyday life, and it is a full hour long. But more than half of that runtime is spent looping a 20 second sample from an obscure film over and over. So this is generally thought of as an EP. Now, what I've just described approaches satirical levels of experimentation, the sort of stuff that isn't even meant to be listened to at all, much less enjoyed. Having crossed that Rubicon, the band took a change of tactics for their next release. Starting with their second official full length, 2002's Hide the Kitchen Knives, songs took on standard, consistent structures that would make them recognizable as songs to the layman. This particular album also incorporated driving punk rhythms, distorted guitars, and haunting strings for an extremely dark and heavy sound. Between this release and their next, John's career as a producer hit a major milestone that saw it building momentum rapidly. In 2003, Austin-based band Explosions in the Sky brought him on as an engineer for their album The Earth Is Not A Cold Dead Place. John says the band brought their songs in fully formed and laid them down practically live, requiring only the barest minimum amount of outside input to make this record as successful as it ended up being. Nevertheless, it was extremely well received and had his name in the credits, so high profile artists began to seek him out to work his magic for them. During this same time period, the Paper Chase's founding keyboardist left the band and was replaced with Sean Kirkpatrick, who had fronted a number of bands in the Texas area and had most recently been a member of Spoon. Perhaps Sean brought some of Spoon's pop sensibilities with him, or maybe the less experimental bands John was working with in the studio had rubbed off on him. But the Paper Chase's style changed once again with 2004's God Bless Your Black Heart. Song structures simplified even further, notes were usually played clean, and they were often selected from major keys, giving most of their songs from here on out the foundation of typical rock songs with a tendency towards the symphonic. This may sound like it means a kinder, gentler paper chase, but the intense and unexpected moments that had become their trademark are still sprinkled across each song, and they now catch the listener completely off guard, giving them an even greater visceral impact. In 2006, they released Now You Are One Of Us, an album exploring the concept of fear being used as a tool for control. This was the moment in time when the war on terror was in full swing, which was never about combating terrorists, but rather stoking fear in the American populace. This was most often accomplished by ratcheting up the widely mocked color-coded threat level in an attempt to manufacture consent for an extremely unpopular war effort. The album that emerged from this political climate never addresses that subject directly though, instead exploring a wide variety of case studies in fear. Now You Are One Of Us marked the departure of founding drummer Aaron Dalton and the recruitment of their new drummer, Jason Garner from the Death Ray Davies, leaving John and bassist Bobby Weaver as the only founding members remaining. The first release with this lineup would come out on May 26, 2009, titled Someday This Could All Be Yours, Volume 1. And the theme for this one is obvious from a glance at the track listing. Every song bears a parenthetical subtitle alluding to a disaster which the song will be discussing, starting with a big one, The Extinction. The extinction of the title is mysterious, but rapidly approaching, and the song talks about people who are doing what they understand to be best practices to combat this unseen foe, but still feel worried that it's all in vain. There's an entire verse in which the beat is kept by the ominous sound of a ticking clock, but it's followed by a moment of what could be interpreted as hope, 
albeit a hope that is itself vague and mysterious for now. This song about doing everything right and knowing deep down that it won't save you is followed by The Forest Fire, which is very much the opposite. The story of someone who invests all their effort in superstitions and sincerely believes that these pointless, often destructive acts will ensure they'll be spared from encroaching flames. The first verse suggests that they're aware of the danger days in advance, plenty of time to make meaningful preparations, but they continue to base their actions on arbitrary traditions and wild guesses, even as their surroundings and ultimately their home are burnt to the ground. All good luck and you Although the subjects of these first two songs may seem diametrically opposed, these could actually be seen as different attitudes towards the same actions. We're frequently sold a personal responsibility narrative to our real-world climate crisis, with people frequently urged to recycle, reduce consumption, buy a Tesla, and countless other acts that all amount to rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Some people actively avoid doing these things out of spite, which is objectively a bad thing to do, but their individual impact is so minimal as to make their choices pathetically impotent. Even if literally everyone did all the environmentally friendly things we were told to do and more, it would have little impact on the US military being the world's largest polluter, or the 100 companies responsible for 70% of all emissions. We are far past the point where the carbon footprint of an average person can possibly matter, so the conscientious subject discussed in The Extinction is functionally identical to the irresponsible one in The Forest Fire. These opening songs are followed by a suite of two tracks that flowed together so seamlessly, I didn't even realize they were separate topics the first few times I heard them. The latter part is called the Mass Hysteria, and it invokes various Christian rituals with increasing desperation to imply that these two will not solve our problems. Preceding this track is the small-scale story of a couple having relationship difficulties, who take a vacation to Mexico to try and rekindle their romance. But while there, one of them falls ill with a communicable disease that threatens to infect the other, a physical manifestation of their marital strife. This song has perhaps the least to say about broad societal issues, but it got a disproportionate amount of attention due to the disaster it represents, and current circumstances make it stick out once again. In June of 2009, within a month of when Someday This Could All Be Yours was initially released, an outbreak of the swine flu began to sweep across the United States. And over the following year, it would spread across the globe, a pandemic that would ultimately infect an estimated 700 million to 1.4 billion people, or between 11 and 21% of the total human population. The index case for this strain of the flu was identified in Veracruz, Mexico, so John's choice to set this story in Mexico seemed prophetic of what was the biggest news story of the day. But the titular epidemic of the song is entirely symbolic, and in fact, every disaster described throughout this album is metaphorical, each representing a destructive aspect of modern society. There's an underlying root cause for all these problems that will finally be clarified and explored in the fifth disaster, The Comet. I beg all bumbling bees, turn against their keepers and sting. All the honey that's running is blood dew, the smoke's a joke I keep playing on you. No one's gonna save you, no one's gonna save you, no one's gonna save you. Your money or your life, your money or your life. Surprise, this is an album about politics. And radical, revolutionary, anti-capitalist politics at that. The message of Someday This Could All Be Yours, when stripped of all artistry and nuance, can be boiled down to, This suckquake of capitalism is a complete waste NATO of my seven bucks on soon. And all our lives and futures, Forest Fire. In this excerpt, the act of beekeeping is used as a stand-in for capitalism, and the bees are encouraged to violently reclaim the fruits of their labor. 
By its very definition, capitalism survives by funneling the value created by workers to those who own the means of production. The cost of being born into this system is, as the song says, your money or your life, as those who fail to produce profit are deprived of their basic needs until they expire. The only way out is through revolution, because no one's gonna save you. That's the most repeated line of the song, and it proved to be astoundingly timely. This album was released just four months after the inauguration of Barack Obama, who was swept into office by poor and desperate people who were hopeful that he would bring about meaningful change for some reason. A US politician helping the poor is antithetical to their job description though, which Obama proved repeatedly throughout his time in office, leaving people in even greater need for a savior that isn't coming. The cosmic nature of this disaster is meant to invoke the horror of being an insignificant part of an unimaginably vast system with whims you could never hope to influence. But by the universal oneness of all things, just being a part of that system gives you real power to affect change, so long as you embrace that unity and organize. After this incredibly important thesis statement for the album, we get The Lightning Bolt, which seems to compare the unlikely beauty of finding your true love to that one in a million chance you'll be struck dead by lightning. Or something like that. I'm asexual and aromantic, and I can't be expected to analyze lyrics that aren't about politics. There was also a video made for this song, what the director describes as a film of found footage, but its value as a promotional tool is limited by the fact that it's chock full of old timey nudity and disturbing imagery. I mean, it uses footage that also appeared on Wonder Shows, and that's all you need to know about the kind of niche audience they were going for here. And I'll have you pictured in my head. I'll have you pictured in Two of the previous songs have framed their disaster as a crime being committed against you, suggesting correctly that there is willful malice behind the apparent misfortunes to which we are constantly subjected. The next song is going to do the same, but the choice of crime this time can be difficult to stomach. John has described his writing style as being like a frying pan to the head. His metaphors are meant to be extreme to the point of ridiculousness. In this way, he's able to speak about subjects in abstract, poetic terms, with minimal risk of having his meaning ignored or misconstrued. This does, however, carry the side effect of the occasional, tasteless comparison to acts of sexual assault like some kind of edgy gaming streamer, and The Flood is the most egregious instance of this. Samples of women screaming and shouts of oh god and what the fuck between lyrics keep you on edge even if you make it past that hurdle. There's really nothing here that isn't said better elsewhere on the album. If you're already well versed in the dangers of capitalism, you don't really need to be subjected to the bludgeoning this track wishes to inflict on you. Cause god only knows how Once you're past the flood, you'll come to The Blizzard, a song whose every lyric I find to be fascinating. And there are a lot of lyrics here, even the chorus changes almost completely upon repetition. According to John, this one's about blind faith, and it talks about the kind of people who beg for scraps from politicians rather than challenge their rule, believing that sort of political engagement to be pointless. Then it shifts to talking about the politicians themselves, whose devotion to a failing system renders them both helpless and useless. Little more than common thieves, but on an unfathomable scale. It's another grim, but insightful look at what is now a very familiar aspect of our society, the minutiae of which I will leave for you to explore on your own. The disaster which graces the cover of the album and the disc itself is The Tornado, so it's no surprise that the song by that title has some very important things to say. 
Its first three verses have more of those frying pan to the head metaphors, each one describing hideous acts of self-destruction in excruciating detail. After it aggressively establishes that allowing capitalism to continue unabated is literally suicide, the song suddenly turns hopeful. It states, with the utmost confidence, that through preparedness and organization, we will overcome this threat, because doing so is by far a lesser act of violence than allowing it to carry on. We're gonna turn this thing The tornado is an anthem to our victory over capitalism, which perfectly encapsulates Someday's overall message, but it's not the final word on the album. There's one more disaster to close things out, and it's represented by the band's most frequent topic of discussion, the human condition. This closing track is every bit as nihilistic as the last song was hopeful, discounting activism of any sort as meaningless, encouraging only the sweet embrace of death. It's a hell of a note to go out on after the journey we've been through, but there is more to it than just that doomer mentality. John is clearly concerned that his warning will be ignored, which he knows to be a lethal error. In an archived post from John's now-deleted Twitter profile, he said that he has identified as a socialist since the 90s and knows full well how hard it is to recruit people into taking a critical stance on capitalism. In this way, he's sort of like Dib from Invader Zim. Someone whose predisposition to assume the worst case scenario made him among the first to realize that humanity actually does face an existential crisis. But he's found that convincing anyone to believe this fact is near impossible. And remember, the disasters discussed here are all symbolic. The threat he's talking about was the exploitation and suffering inherent to capitalism. The fact that literal disasters now occur with far greater frequency and severity as a direct result of the climate crisis which capitalism exacerbates was never an intended part of the message, but it certainly makes his point all the more urgent. Now personally, I'm a huge fan of experimental music, so I've loved the Paper Chase since the first time I heard them. But as experimental art goes, this album is very accessible. All the songs are rooted in the makings of a particularly well-written pop rock song, and the unique flourishes are, with a few exceptions, more of a pleasant surprise than an unwelcome attack. It seems like this was meant to be an album most people could not only tolerate, but enjoy. Not out of the pursuit of commercial success, but to invite as many people into the conversation it's starting as possible. The album does kinda trail off on an unfinished sentence, though. The final track is a pessimism test from which the listener is meant to draw their own conclusions. A poignant statement in and of itself, but that's not how it was meant to end. This is, after all, Someday This Could All Be Yours, Volume 1. So what about Volume 2? Here's John himself from a 2015 podcast answering that very question. Someday This Could All Be Yours is a part one. Is, yeah. is there ever going to be a part two on that? Nah, I mean, it, 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 the, the part two was written, um, and it was partially recorded. It was becoming very obvious that the band was winding, winding down, and uh, that we would not, 
we probably wouldn't play too much more. And my original sort of concept for it was the first half was like sort of like this more aggressive sort of like, you know, it, the record it was, it was like, you know, pretty aggressive, very verbose. And the second half was like sort of like this very defeated, highly depressive record, like slow songs, right? Really, I had to make sort of like a call that I just didn't want that to be the, the band's last statement. And I know this pisses people off, but I, I got this enormous satisfaction by never releasing a part two to something that says part one. I just thought it was the funniest and most valid thing to do would be just to not have a resolution. To, like, make people think that there's another half, there's more to the story, but there isn't because life doesn't have a resolution. Does your life have a plot? I think that Paper Chase fans should be happy that I didn't put it out, honestly, because I don't think it would have been the right way to close the chapter on the band. But moreover, I mean, it was like, the way I look at it, it was like, this is sort of the best statement to be made, is to not put that out. Rather than fulfill their plans to complete the duology by early 2010, the Paper Chase wrapped up their decade-long run as a band soon after the release of Someday Volume 1. Afterwards, John started a new band called The Nighty Night and repurposed some of what was planned for Someday Volume 2 into their debut EP in 2011. If there was any further work done for that lost follow-up, it has never surfaced. It wouldn't be until five years later, in April of 2016, that The Nighty Night put out a full length, and they've released nothing in the five years since. Perhaps John will decide to put out more of his own music eventually, but he certainly doesn't need to with how successful he's been behind the boards. He had a hand in the creation of more than 30 albums in the year 2019 alone, with similar levels of productivity throughout the 2010s and to this day. You've almost certainly heard and loved something that John had a creative impact on, but if you've yet to experience pure Congleton right from the source, he's already provided plenty of unique works of art, each of them dense with inspiring, beautiful, disturbing ideas just waiting for you to weave them into the tapestry of your life. No one's gonna save you. Thank you for watching, as always. It's been a hell of a long time since the last time I was able to make one of these. Hopefully it won't be anywhere near as long before the next one. In the meantime, if you want some more, I did write a text review of the new metal band No One as a Patreon reward. Everyone is welcome to read that for free over on my Patreon page, link in the description. Check that out if you want, see what else I have to offer over there. Maybe even buy a text review of an album of your choosing, if you feel so inclined. I'd certainly appreciate it, as I would any likes or comments that you deem this video to be worthy of.